Thank you. Good morning, Orlando. Good morning, fellow geeks. Um, I actually am a software engineer, was. Uh, I graduated from MIT quite a few years ago in computer science, uh, then drove across country and did my MBA at Stanford, where I worked at a little company called Cisco Systems. Um, there were 400 of us at Cisco. I think 200 understood the internet. Um, and as you see, the internet has disrupted quite a few industries. Um, so I'm going to talk about the future today and some of the technologies that are changing everything. But first, I want to take you back to the past. Anyone from New York? Come on, you can admit it. OK, okay good. Can you see this picture? Can you see the details? Can anyone tell me where the car is? This is 1900 Fifth Avenue, New York. Can anyone see the car? OK, I don't have all day, so I'll show you. That's the car. 1913, can anyone point to the horse? OK, there is a horse in that picture. And this is disruption, people. When disruption happens, it can happen very, very quickly. And this is not the first time that it happened, but it's happening more and more and more. Um, let me forward to 1985. Uh, in 1985, the then largest telecom company in the world, AT&T, uh, not the same AT&T as now, hired one of the most reputable management consulting companies in the world, McKinsey, and they asked them one question. Now, McKinsey, you may know, they charge millions of dollars just to breathe the same air you do, OK? <laughs> and, then, and then they start working, right? And, and, and they asked them one question. How many cell phones will there be in the United States in the year 2000? One question, simple, right? Uh, they went off and they did their thing and dum, bum, 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 and then they came back <laughs> with the answer. 900,000. There's going to be 900,000 cell phone users in the US the year 2000. The real number was. They were off by 120x, not 120%. 120x. And these are some of the smartest kids who graduate from the smartest business schools. OK? Let me forward to 2000. Kodak, year 2000, had a pretty good year. 14 billion revenues, 1.4 billion in earnings. 12 years later, they filed for bankruptcy. So here's a question. Why do smart people? at smart companies consistently. I'm not talking idiots. I'm talking why do smart people at smart companies consistently fail to anticipate, let alone lead, disruptions? And that's the question that I'd like to help you answer and take you into the future with that. And I'll give you three reasons, and I'll talk about some of them, some, some examples. Uh, disruption, how do we think about disruption? Exponential technologies. These are technologies that are going to change everything. And business model innovation. But first of all, let's, let's just, you know, you ask a, a thousand people what disruption means, you get a thousand and two answers. Let's just give you one answer today. Uh, what is disruption? Disruption is basically about creating a new market and in the process, either destroying an old market like um, cars did to the horse carriage market, or significantly transforming them. That is what disruption is. Um, and you know, time after time after time throughout history, it's the experts and the insiders who will dismiss the disruptive opportunities. Digital cameras, nah, that's not going to be a great business. Personal computers, who would want to own one anyway, right? So the experts are the ones who dismiss these opportunities. So let me start with 
disruption models, three. Um, the traditional one that we've been using over the last um, 20 years is the concept of disruption from below. Um, and essentially it means you start out with off the shelf, you put together software, hardware, off the shelf uh, products that are initially less capable. So that's what folks in personal computing did. Um, and uh, you know, they, have, they have less performance than the mainstream markets, uh, but they improve quality and performance and lower costs at a faster rate than what the mainstream market products do. And by doing that over years or decades, they get to disrupt what was before the mainstream market. And the examples are personal computers and digital cameras, and an example now is solar power. So this is disruption from below. Uh, and again, you have the experts telling you that you know electric light, who would want electric light? I mean, when we close the show, we don't need it. I mean, that, that's what experts would, would tell you. Um, and you know, one of those experts came from the newspaper industry. Do you remember the print newspaper industry? You know, they were, they were doing pretty great. In fact, even after the internet first burst onto the scene in the mid 90s, they were still growing revenues. So you had people saying, ah, the web, not, not, it's, it's cool, it's neat, it's, 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 it's nice. And then here's what happened. So, so basically, uh, what was missing was one ingredient in, at that point in time, and I'll talk about that one ingredient later. Actually, I'll tell you, it's business model innovation, but I'll come back to that later. Now, the second model that I wanna, that I wanna tell you about is disruption from above. Um, and you have, does anyone have a Tesla? Has anyone driven a Tesla? You should. Um, well, it's not about the Tesla. I'll talk about the Tesla in a few minutes. But in general, when you have superior products uh, and services that are more capable than existing mainstream market uh, providers are offering, but their technology cost curve is going down, meaning their costs are going down so fast that pretty soon they're gonna basically disrupt, but from above, from expensive. So they don't start as cheap, they start as really good products that cut costs. Okay, so I'm gonna come back to this. Uh, this is the electric vehicle cost curve uh, over the next uh, 15 years, and I'll come back to this later. There's something called Big Bang Disruption. Big Bang, and this is something new. Big Bang, you start out with products that are better, faster, and cheaper than the existing products. Now this is, we see a lot of this in apps, in software. So um, they, they, let me give you one example, Google Maps with driving directions. Does anyone use them, Google Maps with driving directions? So before Google Maps with driving directions, there were dedicated GPS boxes, Garmin, TomTom. Tom. Um, and then here's what happened. This is the day when Google Maps with driving directions and API came out. Look at Garmin's stock price. Boom, that's it. I mean, from day one, the company was disrupted because Google Maps was better, faster, cheaper from day one because we could do software downloads every day because they were improving the, 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 the location-based mapping every day and so on. So this is disruption from above. And the question is how can new products be better, cheaper, faster, and more customizable on day one? Okay, so I've talked about disruption from below, from above, from Big Bang. You know, this is a salsa dance, right? I mean, we're like, you can disrupt, be disrupted from anywhere. And, and that's part of the message. 
Um, but the reason that you can be better, faster, cheaper is something called exponential technologies. And exponential technologies, you know what they are. I mean, basically, you all make the big bucks because of Moore's law. Basically, all software, all hardware, all internet jobs are based, have been created because of Moore's law and others. But essentially, what Moore's law says is that the number of transistors per dollar improves at a rate of 41% per year. Per year. Now, when you compound this 41% over 10 years, 20 years, and 30 years, you get the 10x, 100x, 1,000x, and in the case of Moore's Law, over the last 40 years, 1 billion x improvement in technology per cost. 1 billion x. Now, imagine all the disruptions that have been caused by the world of computers, by information technology. Um, and Moore's Law is the first one that, that we think about, but there are others. Network capacity has its own Butters Law, basically 50% improvement every nine months. Uh, hard disk storage improves by 50% every 18 months. Uh, Handy's Law, uh, digital imaging. By the way, the Handy, the guy who discovered Handy's Law for digital imaging that it improves at a rate of 58% per year, was a Kodak employee in Australia, okay? A Kodak employee discovered that law. Um, now, let me differentiate one thing. Exponential technologies are the technologies that are, that are improving exponentially. Exponential markets is market adoption that is improving exponentially. Now, when we have both, we have huge opportunities, but we may not have both at the same time. Now, markets, exponential markets, are markets that are growing exponentially. Now, believe it or not, at one point in history, there were 111 internet hosts in the whole world. That was 77. It took seven years for the first 10x to go to 1,000. Then it took two years, uh, three years, for the next 10x uh, increase, 1987. Ten, another two years for another 10x, another three years for another 10x. You see where the world is going? The internet? So I was at Cisco 93, and I was looking at this. So what was I thinking? I mean, you know, really, you don't need to have an engineering degree to do the exponential math that this internet thing that only 200 people know about in 1993 uh, uh, is going to be a billion nodes by 2000 or so, right? But of course, when you say that, people look at you like you have 10 heads. You're like, they're like, but, but this is whatever, and they make up any excuse that experts do, right? And of course, in 2012, it, it did hit 1 billion nodes. It took another 20 years for another 1,000x. Okay, so this is an exponential market. Now, let me give you the key exponentially improving technologies that, in my opinion, are going to change everything. And when I say everything, I mean everything. Every single industry on Earth is going to be disrupted by a combination of these technologies, 3D printings and sensors and robotics. And I'm going to go through a few of these tonight, some examples. Um, E-money, solar PV, electric vehicles. So let me, let me start with sensors. Um, and sensors and the Internet of Things have been linked um, because the Internet of Things is rising because of sensors, and I'll show you why. Since the iPhone came out, 2007, can you believe 2007? It's only been out seven years. Since the iPhone came out, 2007, 
the number of sensors in the world, the market, has gone up by 1,000x. Now, I just told you that any 10x could give you a disruptive opportunity. 1,000x. The cost of sensors, down 1,000x. The size, down 1,000x. The number of transistors per sensor is up 1,000x. These are just astonishing numbers that you can only get through exponential technologies, exponential improvements. And now we know. Now we know the iPhone and, of course, the, the Android phones, how they have disrupted total industry. I mean, who knew the taxi industry was going to be disrupted by smartphones, right? I mean, um, uh, this is astonishing. So these are some of the actual numbers. This is how fast the number of sensors, the market for sensors, has been growing over the last few years. And this is 2012 numbers. I mean, look at oscillators growing at 700% per year. I mean, you don't need to do the math to see how, how many sensors we're going to have in the world pretty soon, right? Growing at 300, 700% per year. And in fact, there's a new organization called Trillion Sensor uh, Summit, T-Sensors, uh, that was started last year to precisely look at the Internet of Things and look at sensors and look at standardization and all that good stuff. And some of the numbers that we're looking at are astonishing. We're looking at 10 trillion sensors by 2025. Now, we have 10 billion sensors per year now. We're looking at 10 trillion sensors by, by, by 2025. Now, think about that number again. There are 7 billion people on Earth, 10 trillion sensors. That's 1,300 sensors per person, per year. OK, those are the numbers that, 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 that we're anticipating. And let me give you a few examples of what you can do with sensors and, in fact, what is being done with sensors. This is a $300 headset that essentially knows what you're thinking. OK, don't go on a date with one of these, right? <laughs> It knows what you're thinking and what you're feeling. It, it basically senses your brainwaves and so on. $300. Maybe you should go on that date and give it to the other person. Um, so this is, does anyone use Fitbit? So yeah, Fitbit, uh, my ex-girlfriend is a runner. She uses a Fitbit all day. She tracks the number of steps, how, how many miles she runs, and all that stuff. Um, now, there's BellaBeat, which is like a Fitbit for pregnancy. So not track just your steps, but also you track your baby. The health, cardiac, it distinguishes between your heartbeat and your babies, and so on and so forth. And this is a, a hundred bucks. And these are the kinds of products that are coming out uh, of this sensor revolution. Wearables, t-shirts, t-shirts that basically have embedded ECGs. ECGs, I mean, who went to the hospital and got charged tens of thousands of dollars for ECGs, right? These are wearable, washable T-shirts with embedded ECGs. Um, so healthcare is being disrupted. The, 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 the disruption in healthcare is astonishing that's coming. Um, but it's not just about health. Um, Ears that perk up when you're in a good mood? <laughs> this is a real product <laughs> that you put on the headset. You're in a good mood, they perk up, right? Uh, your doggy will understand. And of course, if you have the ear, you have to have the tail that wags when you're in a good mood. Uh, this is a separate product, but you could combine them. Uh, <laughs> so you can also play a little bit with, with, with uh, sensors. Now, vehicle-to-vehicle -vehicle communication. Um, the whole automotive industry is being uh, uh, radically transformed by sensors. And in fact, there are uh, some rules, some federal uh, folks working on making it mandatory to, to have vehicle-to-vehicle -vehicle communications. Uh, because for new vehicles, because 
it, it helps so much with um, accidents, diminishing accidents and, and all that stuff. But essentially, as far as we're concerned, these are sensors that talk to one another, cars that talk to one another, cars that talk to the uh, light. Are you going to turn green soon? Or they, they essentially they talk about that. And they also talk to buses and trains and bikes and all that stuff. So everyone is going to be connected through everyone through all these sensors. And, and, and does anyone use the Nest thermostat? Um, again, this is just a few sensors. This was possible. Nest thermostat. I mean, who knew that a thermostat company would be acquired by Google for $3 billion. Um, and this is essentially a bunch of sensors connected uh, to the cloud. It, it learns about your behavior. It, it lowers the temperature when, when, or, or, or pushes it up, depending on, on, on what you like, right? It, it, it sets the temperature half an hour before you come home. It learns about it. So it's a combination of AI a little bit. Um, but here's one of the big things we need to know about sensors and the Internet of Things. All of these sensors are generating data real time. Real time. So the number of sensor-based devices is growing exponentially. The number of sensors within each device is growing exponentially. The amount of data generated real time by each one of these sensors is growing exponentially. See where I'm going? Uh, the number of connections between all these sensors is growing exponentially. So this is exponential on exponential on exponential on exponential, right? This is essentially a combinatorial explosion of data that's coming. And that's the Internet of Things. And, you know, start thinking Bronto data and Epto data. See, we're at the exabyte level. We're talking about a million, a billion, a trillion X, the amount of data. And that's what the Internet of Things is going to be. We don't have the technologies. We don't have the software. We don't have the hardware to deal with this. In my mind, these are the big opportunities to create and disrupt markets. It's, it, it's about both. OK? Let me show you robotics, another exponentially improving technology, robotics. And what are robots but computers? I mean, if you break it up, a robot, you'll see a bunch of sensors, a bunch of hard drives, a bunch of CPUs, and, and so on and so forth, right? Let me show you one which you may have seen. Um, it's called Baxter. Um, and it came out of MIT. Um, Essentially, Baxter is a robot that costs around $20,000 for manufacturing. So it, it does very simple things like packaging things and moving things around and whatnot. And what I want to show you here is the difference between Baxter in 2013 and Baxter in 2014, just one year difference. Um, and look at the part count, how it's increasing. So how, how much faster the same product is just one year later. So I'm looking here, part count is going what, 4x, 5x, in one year, right? One year. Now, let's assume that you can keep this exponential improvement going. 3x one year is 9x in two years is 27x, and you can do the numbers, right? And pretty soon, you know, we'll have movies about the robot. No, I'm not going to go there. Um, so, so you can see the exponential improvement in robots. Robots are coming, smart, uh, dexterous, uh, strong. And so part count is going up 3x, just in this one example, OK? That's robotics. 3D printing, another exponential technology that's going to change everything. 3D printing. <laughs> Did I miss something? OK. So 3D printing, um, usually people think toys and jewelry. And in fact, there's a very healthy market for uh, artists and craftspeople who have been designing jewelry using 3D printers because you, in fact,
can do things with what's called additive manufacturing, uh, 3D printing, that you cannot do with uh, normal manufacturing. But in fact, um, the, 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 there are 3D printers that are 3D printing you. Um, Invisalign printed 17 million dental braces last year. 17 million braces, 3D printing. This is a little factory in San Jose. No people, essentially, with a bunch of 3D printers just printing braces. And each brace is unique to the, basically the person who uploaded the, 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 the CAT scan, right? And we're printing, they're printing essentially every body part right now. Um, turbine, GE is printing turbines, turbine parts. Think about that when you get on the airplane tonight, okay? <laughs> um, and they're investing billions of dollars in 3D printing, and they want to do 100,000 products by 2020. But even today, they're 3D printing turbine parts. Um, a house, the world's first 3D printed house, is going up this year in Amsterdam. A house, I mean, why not? If you can print a little thing, you can print a big thing, right? It's essentially the same technology. So 3D printing is gonna radically transform manufacturing and construction and a lot of industries. Um, so let me switch the conversation a little bit um, and take you back again into automotive. Uh, in the early 1900s, I already showed a couple of slides, 7.7% of American families owned a car. Uh, 11 years later, 80% of them did. Again, disruption. It took 11 years to go essentially through the whole market. Um, what happened here? What happened? Yes, it was a disruptive technology, but what happened in these 11 years? I'll tell you what happened. GMAC happened. DuPont and GM got together and invented a new financial innovation, a new business model innovation called car loans. Because cars were essentially one year, the equivalent to a one year salary of the American worker. So why not have us pay 100 bucks a month forever instead of you know, what we could not afford, right? Uh, so that basically in seven years, 75% of Americans were starting to buy cars on credit. That's a business model innovation. Forward to 1986, Kodak. Now, in the literature, you hear that Kodak, oh my God, how could they miss out on the digital camera opportunity, right? I told you they went bankrupt in 2012, right? Um, but in fact, Kodak invented digital cameras. They invented digital imaging. They had more than 1,000 patents in digital imaging. They put out the first uh, professional digital camera. They invented the world's first megapixel camera sensor. Kodak invented digital photography. And if you look at uh, uh, a newspaper at the time called the Industry Standard, uh, an interview with the then CEO of Kodak, Pat Patricia Russo, um, she said, there is a $225 billion digital photography market coming, okay? And we're gonna grab a slice of, of, of every photo transaction. And this is Patricia Russo. We invented digital cameras, we know the business, we know the market, and we are going to make $200 billion, okay? So they did not miss the fact that this was gonna be big, right? So, you know, they invented the technologies, they knew the photo market, they were the top brand in photography in the world. They still are, even after going bankrupt. And they got the fact that it was going to be a $225 billion opportunity. And yet, they did not capitalize on it. So, knowing technologies is not enough, knowing the market is not enough, what were they missing? Here's what they were missing, okay? What's wrong with that picture? Here's what's wrong with that picture. And I wanna focus in on one part of that interview. 
Patricia Russo said, we're going to grab a slice of just about every photo transaction. Now, that's their business model with film. Every time you clicked, you burned film. Every time you uh, process the, the, the photo, you, you, use, you use chemicals, you use paper, and so on and so forth. Do you think anyone can grab a slice of every transaction with digital photos? No, not going to happen. The cost, the marginal cost of each picture that we take is zero. The cost of uploading it, zero. The cost of storing it, zero. So when the marginal cost, and this is software and data in general, when the marginal cost of something is zero, you cannot do this. So they actually missed out on the new business models that were going to win in digital photography. I mean, what is Facebook but a photo upload website? Think about it, right? But, but they don't make money on the pictures, they make money on advertising. Uh, and this is one of the business model innovations that came out of digital photography, but Kodak did not make any money doing that. So business model innovation is every bit as important as technology innovation. So let's put this whole thing together. Can we anticipate and lead. Let me go back to the auto industry. So in 2013, the Tesla Model S was named by uh, Motor Trend the car of the year. Not just the electric car of the year, the car of the year. Consumer Reports said, this is the best car we have ever tested, ever, okay? Superior product. Um, but who can afford an electric vehicle, right? It's a little bit pricey. But, but let's, let's, let's decide if the electric vehicle is disruptive. Because if it's not, no bother going through this exercise. One, I'll give you three reasons. I can give you nine. I'll give you three. One is that the electric motor is five times more energy efficient than the, uh, the internal combustion engine. So your car only uses 20% of the gasoline, the energy in the gasoline, uh, to move the car. The other 80% literally goes up in smoke. The, the, the electric motor turns 90 to 95% of the energy in the battery into actual productive energy. Um, the EV is at least 10x cheaper to fuel. So Consumer Reports said that Jeep Liberty, um, fueling it for five years would cost $15,000. $15,000. The equivalent EV would cost $1,500. Now, you know, all this varies with local conditions of, of electricity prices and, 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 and gasoline prices, but 10x at least cheaper to fuel an electric uh, vehicle. Now, 1,500 bucks in five years is not a whole lot of money, right? Um, it takes, uh, the, the, the electric vehicle is at least also again a 10x uh, improvement in maintenance. It's 10x cheaper to maintain. You don't have all those parts that you have with the internal combustion engine with the electric vehicle. If you see the EV, if you see it actually naked, um, the, the, the EV is essentially a computer tablet on wheels. So think about the EV and the self-driving car as computer tablets on wheels. They're getting better exponentially, okay? Um, so, do we have interesting business model innovations for uh, uh, electric vehicle manufacturers? Yeah, I mean, if we have 10x improvements in, in operations and maintenance and in fueling, look at what Tesla's doing. Infinite mile warranty for eight years. That's what Tesla's giving. Infinite. You can drive up to the moon and back several times if you want, 
for eight years, and you're under warranty. And that's something that internal combustion, that Detroit cannot do because cars break down. Electric vehicles don't. They have 90% fewer parts, and the electric motor lasts forever, pretty much. How about free charging? Free charging. Tesla's offering free charging at um, uh, Tesla stations. Now, is this going to make them go bankrupt? No. This is essentially $1,500 over five years. That's at most what it's going to cost them. Detroit gives actually car dealers $4,000 for every car that they sell. So in fact, if Tesla gave you nine at uh, $1,500, it's still cheaper than what Detroit does. So these are disruptive business models that Detroit cannot possibly compete with. So once they're at price parity, basically the internal combustion engine vehicle is over. Yeah? And how long is that transition going to take? So let's do the numbers. Um, so let's assume 200 miles minimum range for electric vehicles. That's the minimum for mainstream adoption, which means, and I won't take you into all the little numbers, but which means that 2013 numbers, uh, you can build a, an electric vehicle car that goes 200 miles for 75K. And that's basically what a Tesla Model S costs. However, your laptops, your laptop uh, uh, batteries have been going down in price 14% per year. So that compounds, right? 14% per year. And those are the same, almost the same batteries that Tesla is using. Um, but investments have increased. The market has increased, which effectively means that over the last four years, that exponential acceleration has accelerated. And now lithium ion batteries are going down at 16% per year. And if you take that 16% cost curve, right, we're disrupting from above, we start at 75 grand. That means that by 2017 or 18, the electric vehicle industry can build an affordable $40,000 SUV that goes to 100 miles and has the performance of a Porsche 911 Carrera. <laughs> now, where do you think the market's going to go? $40,000 SUV with the performance of a Porsche 911 Carrera that you don't need to fuel at $1,500 in, in five years and infinite mile warranty. Where do you think the world is going? By 2020, the EV uh, uh, industry is going to be able to produce a $31,000 car. Now, $31,000 is the average car in America. So they will hit the mainstream of the car market right in the head 2020. That's only six years from now. By 2022, it'll hit the low end. So the low end car in America costs $21,000. And EVs will be able to manufacture a $22,000 car with the performance, did I say with the performance of a kind of Porsche 911? OK. Um, 2022, people, I'm not talking about even 2030. Now, there may be delays in the market and this and that, but essentially, look, Tesla already announced that uh, they're coming up with a $40,000 um, Model E in 2016-17. It'll be 20% 20, 20 smaller, so 80% the performance of the Porsche 911 Carrera. And Foxconn, did, did I tell you that the, that the EV is, is, is a computer tablet on wheels? Well, Foxconn thinks so. Uh, Foxconn is the Chinese company that makes iPhones um, and the tablets. And they said, we're investing $800 million to build an electric vehicle. Because essentially, this is a computer on wheels, and we know how to make computers. And we're targeting $15,000, not 40. OK? Um, so if right, you do the numbers, and I suggest you do, and you come up with these same figures, you'll understand why the mass migration from the internal combustion engine vehicle 
to electric vehicles is going to start around 2017, 2018. All new cars will be electric by 2030, all of them. Every new mass market car will be electric by 2030. Notice the number said 2022. I'm just saying 2030, OK? So the whole automobile industry is going to be disrupted by electric vehicles, all of it. And oil is going to be obsolete. We don't need oil when all cars are electric by 2030. OK, so this is one industry. And if you go through each and every industry with this kind of methodology, what you realize is this. We have entered an era of permanent disruption. We have entered an era of permanent disruption. The world is being disrupted at a faster pace by all of these exponential technologies that I showed you, the combination of them. And I haven't even showed the artificial intelligence and how you put it with the Internet of Things and sensors and the 3D printers. And, combine them, and you come up with this realization. Every single industry in the world is going to be disrupted over the next 10 to 15 years. We're going to see the most massive disruption in history, maybe since the first Industrial Revolution, uh, the only comparable. But it's going to be just all of these are going to be disrupted, every single last one of them. Um, so what I'm showing you there is the book and that, that I just published two months ago, and people are paying attention, and I highlight energy, automotive, and logistics as three things that I touch, but the same methodology you can apply to any industry, right? Um, and here's the good thing for you, uh, fellow geeks. Information technologies are at the core of all these disruptions. Information technologies, sensors, uh, artificial intelligence, robotics, 3D printing, everything is turning into software and data, everything. Okay, everything is being digitized, everything is being dematerialized. Dematerialized means we go from film to digital, for instance. We go from oil to photons. We're dematerializing a lot of the things, and IT technologies are at the center of, of all of these disruptions. All of these products, robots, electric vehicles, uh, uh, sensors, everything has to do with information technology. And this is not in the future. This is happening right now as we speak. Disruptions are happening as we speak. And choosing to wait is essentially choosing to be disrupted. The time is now. This is not in the future. The time is now. Thank you.